All right, good evening, folks. We are um, doing a makeup study from from last week. As you know, we had uh, internet problems, and so we're going to be doing the uh, the lesson on the Tao Wei, uh, which I don't even know how many of you got into it last week, but uh, um, the uh, scripture lesson is Galatians three. 13 and 14, and I'll read this to those who, of you who are on telephones rather than on online. Galatians 3, 13 through 14, Messiah liberated us from Torah's curse, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, in order that through Messiah, Yeshua, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so we might receive the promise of the Ruach through trusting faith. Okay, and tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to mute everyone, see if that will reduce some of that uh, R2-D2 that we, uh, that we had. So, all right, everybody's muted. If you need to uh, uh, say something, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and type it in for us. All right. Um, We go within Judaism. Uh, Yeshua of Nazareth has often been known by the name of Tawi, and uh, that's T A L U I E, um, and uh, uh, our Hat Tawi, which uh, literally translated means the hanged one, or in in context would mean the crucified one. So in the um, in the Talmudic era, the word Tawi was uh, was a term that that was that meant uh, uncertainty, and um, um, the um, okay. What's the uh, the uh, reference for the uh, Tawi? Um, well, I tell you what, I've run into it in dealing <laughs> with uh, with the Jewish folks that uh, uh, they would say that. Uh, uh, that uh, Yeshua could not have been the uh, the Messiah because he was hanged on a tree, and uh, and they they knew that business about the cursed, uh, and he was you know he was he died, and he was hanged on a, on a cross, so therefore he was cursed. But uh, uh, that's uh, that term Tawi was uh, it's a it's in the Talmud. I could I, I could look it up and uh, and get it for you, um, and it's. Uh, it was used for a term of uncertainty, and uh, you know we still use that concept today in English. You know we say something is, uh, you know something is left hanging. You know when you don't get it done, and it's it's kind of uncertain where you're going to get it done or not, um, or you know a hung jury, um, or something's hanging by a thread, um, or uh, you know those of us that have done the military thing, a hang fire. Which means that you're on the, you're, you're shooting and you pull the trigger and nothing happens. And so you don't know whether you got a, um, a round that did not, uh, eject out of the chamber or you got a round in the chamber that, uh, did not uh, detonate. Um, so it's, it just means uncertainty. And so, um, uh, just something, the, a situation that which the, the outcome of which is, is left in, in doubt. And so, um, in the Second Temple era, there was there was actually a, a guilt offering that they would that they would uh, uh, give for the uh, for uncertainty, and that is uh, Leviticus five seventeen. Uh, it says, "Now, if anyone sins in one of Adonai's commandments that are not to be uh, not to be done, though he did not know it." Uh, still, he is guilty and will bear his iniquity. He is to bring to the Kohen of the, the priest a ram without blemish from the from the flock, according to your value, as a trespass offering. Then the Kohen, the priest, is to make atonement for him over the sin that he committed unknowingly, and he will be forgiven. It is a trespass sin. He is uh, absolutely guilty before um, uh, before Adonai. Now, um, 
so this kind of tells us that um, that um, you know ignorance is no excuse before the law. You know that's still a, a concept that today that uh, um, <laughs> you know, if you if you're exceeding the speed limit and uh, you know the cop pulls you over and he says you know this is the speed the speed limit's 55 and you said and you were doing 65 and you said well I didn't know and said well that's that's not gonna that's not gonna fly. And uh, the same kind of concept uh, with the Lord. He says, look, you know, this, these are the rules. And if you don't know um, that, um, that rule, uh, that's just too bad. You still, you still broke the law. So um, the Talmud uh, related that uh, during the second, uh, second temple period, there was a, a man, uh, his name was Baba Ben Buta. And he brought an asham to, to Tawi, uh, which is a guilt offering, uh, to the temple every day because he thought, yeah, perhaps I have transgressed and did not know it. So he was always going to err on the side of, of um, caution. Now, if you go back to the book of Job and you remember that, um, you know, Job was a righteous man and he had some... Uh, some children that, oh, yeah, not so much. Uh, they were they were not so righteous. But uh, what Job did was he offered sacrifices for his for his children, so that uh, you know his his idea was well, look, if I offer sacrifices for them, maybe then they will uh, uh, that will count for their. Uh, their sins that they're doing because he said, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, if I offer sacrifices uh, on their behalf, perhaps then uh, they would uh, be justified before the Lord. Well, as we know, that that didn't work out so so well for his uh, first batch of children because their their sin was required. Uh, the penalty was required of them. And uh, uh, Yeshua has been uh, contemptuously called uh, Talwi, uh, meaning the crucified one. But it can also mean uncertainty, like we talked about. And so uh, if it is uncertain, what, um, um, you know, we might say this uncertainty uh, might Yeshua, well, might he not be the promised uh, Messiah? What if he what if he is the Messiah? And what if the claims are true? You know, Isaiah 53.10 predicts that the Messiah will suffer on behalf of the nation when his soul makes an offering for guilt, asham. Or the, and uh, uh, same word for guilt is asham. Yeshua, the crucified one, went to the cross as an asham talwi, so to speak. Um, so the, um, we're seeing here that this... This one, the crucified one, was uh, was Yeshua, and we'll we'll go ahead and, and explore this a little bit more in uh, Deuteronomy. Looking at, looking at this, where this comes from, Deuteronomy 21 and uh, 22 through 23. Suppose a man is guilty of a sin with a death sentence, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His body is not to remain all night on the tree. Instead, you must certainly bury him that same day, for anyone hanged is a curse of God. You must not defile your land that Adonai, your God, is giving you as an inheritance. Now, um, that that scripture here, something that I, I came to realize in studying this lesson, um, this passage here in Deuteronomy was not um, uh, was not referring to crucifixion or hanging up on a tree um, because crucifixion was never a Jewish um, practice of uh, execution. Uh, the nowhere uh, do we see that God prescribed crucifixion for um, for a death penalty, uh, the only things that we see um, is uh, you know the the standard uh, execution was stoning, and so uh, a lot of what would happen is that if a person they were executed first, 
and then if their crime was was one that was so heinous that uh, they wanted to make uh, a, a um, an example of him, then the body, after it had already been uh, killed, was hung up, and uh, it was it was then kind of a uh, um, an example to everyone else that uh, don't don't do this. So the sequence was that a man was found guilty of a capital crime. He was executed by stoning, and then after uh, he was dead, his body would be hung up on a tree or a stake or, or somehow you know, lifted up as an example to the populace and uh, so that it would warn other wrongdoers that a similar fate would befall them if uh, they committed similar crimes. Um, it was never a Jewish uh, method of execution. Now, the Romans... Uh, they they used uh, uh, crucifixion for just a whole host of things, uh, anything from piracy, robbery, assassination, forgery, um, false testimony, mutiny, sedition, or rebellion. The uh, the Romans also crucified deserters uh, and slaves who denounced their masters. Um, and, you know, there's a famous uh, uh, revolt that that popped up um, uh, back in those days. It was a guy named Spartacus who was a, uh, a gladiator, and um, he led a revolt against the, the Roman uh, Empire. And, uh, I mean, this thing was, it started out, the Romans uh, decided, well, you know, it's not so... You know, it's not a serious threat, but it kept growing and growing and growing. It got to the point where, you know, there were you know, hundreds of thousands of people that were sympathizers with Spartacus. And uh, then they finally were defeated. Uh, Spartacus was defeated. And although, you know, in the battle, um, they say he was killed, but his body was never found. So we don't know whatever happened to Spartacus, but um, they did take... Um, 6,000 of his followers, and they were crucified. Uh, the, you know, can you imagine that they would uh, take all these guys instead of, you know, sending them off to prison or something like that? They just lined the highways with these guys, 6,000 of them. Um, at one point, uh, they said during the Jewish revolt, there was it was said that um, – um, all of the trees of uh, Judea uh, were uh, cut down uh, for the uh, to be used as uh, crucifixes uh, for the for the Jewish people. They said that the whole lands uh, the whole landscape was just uh, denuded of trees to be used for uh, the sacrifices. Uh, the Romans now um, again. Okay, I'm being nerdy. Uh, but uh, the, these are the types of crosses that were used sometimes. Uh, some some was just a, 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 a one stake, you know, sticks uh, up in the up in the air, just one uh, deal. And so they would uh, uh, tie the guy up and and uh, either nail him to this uh, uh, stake, you know, the hands and the feet, or, or perhaps um, uh, they would just tie him up there. And then uh, just leave him there till he died. And then there was the uh, the T, which um, is uh, you know that was a fairly common one. Of course, then the the cross that uh, that has become synonymous with uh, the the Christian version of the of the crucifix crucifixion. And then they have the X, um, which is another uh, was another uh, common form of, of crucifixion and uh, either either way it was um, it was a terrible um, terrible um, way to die now the question there was a question did any of the crosses ever take the the uh, uh, ever look like the letter Tav uh, I have heard that but then to do that you would have to go back to paleo uh, Hebrew where it was the tav was uh, did take a form uh, something like a uh, if you took I guess the the Christian cross here and um, 
somewhere along, you know, made the, the horizontal bar uh, a little bit lower so it was almost equidistant. That was the, uh, the top. I don't, uh, I don't get into Paleo Hebrew, uh, very much, um, because uh, I have a hard enough time with, uh, um, with just, uh, biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew that, uh, I don't have the time to deal with, uh, with that, but it, uh, you know, I have read that, uh, they said that the, the ancient Tav, um, was, uh, a, a form of a cross. And, uh, so they they use that to, some people use that as some kind of symbology, uh, that, um, the, you know, the Aleph Tav, the beginning and the end, the, um, which Yeshua said he was not, it, it was in uh, in Revelation where it said, "I am the Alpha and the Omega," um, which um, you know would be synonymous with uh, the uh, Aleph and Tav, or the beginning and the end. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't. Uh, some people make a you know a real big study of this, also with the uh, the Aleph Tav um, in in Hebrew. Uh, that, you know, every time it was used, that was a, uh, that was significant of Yeshua. Well, no, it's not. Um, and, um, um, so, um, anyway, the, the Aleph Tav, that's the et in, uh, in Hebrew, it's a, uh, it's, uh, okay. And I'm talking off the top of my head here because now I can't remember the, the, uh, part particle of speech that it is but it's uh <clears throat> it uh it's it's a particle of speech it's not uh not so much uh something that's going to point to yeshua every time it's it's used so um um anyway as far as the uh, whether or not the tab was ever a two post between uh or two uh, what is two posts with a cross beam between them? Now, I've never seen any kind of um, uh, crucifix that um, was like that. Um, and and all the study that I did on crucifixion, <clears throat> it just didn't. Uh, it didn't. Um, you know, doesn't look like the modern uh, Hebrew of top. So anyway, uh, so you can see that. Um, we can we can readily see why Tawi became a common name for Yeshua because he was hung up on a on a cross, and you know that was a big deal back in those days because uh, Yeshua was extremely popular among the among the people, and um, he uh, so there in Jerusalem you know it was it was uh, well known and it was a big deal that uh, he was on this cross. And then by him being hung on a cross, the, the, the people there would remember this, this, uh, uh, the scriptures in Deuteronomy where it says, uh, uh, everyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. And so, you know, he was hung on the cross and he, so therefore he must be accursed. And so that's what would, people would call him that he can't be the Messiah because he was accursed of God. So, however, um, in truth, it wasn't the fact that a man was hung on a tree that made him accursed so much as um, it was the the, the uh, crime that he committed that um, that caused him to be hung up on the on the cross because or on a tree or something because uh, it was not uncommon in those days for warriors. When they were defeated, you know, kings or, or chiefs or princes or whatever, when they were uh, defeated, that uh, their bodies would be hung up um, on a tree or a, a cross of some sort or some kind of a stake. They would be uh, lifted up so that everyone can see, OK, here's the mighty king that uh, came against us. And now he's uh, he's buzzard food. And so um, was. Um, you know, were these were these warriors accursed? Um, the Bible says that you know every man that hangs on a on a tree uh, is cursed. But in in context, I believe it meant that hang uh, hung on a tree in conjunction with their with their death penalty. So 
um, it was it was the fact that he was guilty of a capital crime and then put to death for that crime. Um, and I think that uh, again, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, philosophizing a little bit here. That uh, by the same token, it wasn't the fact that Yeshua was hung on a cross that made him accursed, uh, although that had part of it. But what he did was he took on the sins of mankind for which the penalty was death. It would be just like a murderer, who a, a man who goes out and kills someone, um, and he is caught, he's gone, he goes to trial, he's convicted, and he's executed. And, uh, you know, he's, he has to pay the, the penalty of his crime. In the case of Yeshua, though, he willingly took on all this penalty of death and he paid that penalty, uh, for, for the sin of all mankind. And that made him accursed before the Father because he, he willingly took on this death penalty. And as a result of that, uh, in the, uh, symbolically, he was uh, lifted up onto this cross, and therefore he was accursed. Um, and we see that the um, uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, which had, I had already um, read, is, you know, it's still uh, used by the anti-Yeshua crowd. Uh, it was used back in the day of Paul. I imagine Paul even used it a little bit, uh, probably. So this cannot be the the Messiah because he was accursed of God. He was hung up on a on a uh, uh, tree, and uh, uh, Jewish people have actually uh, said the same thing to me when I'm trying to talk to them about Yeshua. Is that you know he Yeshua could not have been the Messiah because he died. He was hung up on a cross. That makes him accursed. And uh, later, later, Paul, um, he's, you know, he said here, and I've got it on the slide there, that uh, <clears throat> um, that First Corinthians twelve three. So therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Ruach Elohim says Yeshua be cursed, and no one can say Yeshua is Lord except by the Ruach Hakodesh. And uh, so uh, what he's saying here is that if you're getting up there and you're saying that Yeshua uh, is is cursed or he is a curse of God, then that's not coming from the Lord. You're, you're not getting that knowledge, whatever, you know, that uh, you're not coming to uh, that conclusion uh, from the Lord. It's only uh, the the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, is the is the one that uh, says no Yeshua is Lord the the Ruach Hakodesh will never ever say that Yeshua was um, was uh, accursed and um, so Yeshua took on this curse by uh, that is represented by the hanging and so Paul is is um, coming to this uh, that. Um, he took this insult and he turned it around, uh, you know, and I said, I think Paul even probably used this insult, this insult um, when he was uh, capturing and, and killing Christians before uh, his Damascus Road uh, incident. And uh, so Paul took that then and turned it right around. He spun it, I guess we would say in today's uh, vernacular and said okay yeah yeah he was a curse he was he was uh, he took on this curse uh because he took on our sin and so he's telling these uh, gentiles in in uh, galatia that uh now look if you take on the judaism then you're you're uh, taking on all of the commandments and um and so we're going to get into a couple of, of verses here um, that, uh, you know, I, I still want to get a point, the point across that only faith in Yeshua leads to uh, redemption. There are not two ways of, of uh, redemption. So before we go on, I just make, make sure that, that uh, everyone understands that. 
um, because uh, it had been pointed out to me that sometimes in my in my uh, slides that uh, when I'm arguing one side against the other, I don't make it clear that I'm I'm putting a hypothesis up here and an antithesis over on the other side of it, and it it uh, it confuses uh, some people and and uh, they they. Uh, sometimes want to know what in the world is this guy thinking and uh, that's you know so I try to try to clear that up for you um, so that Paul's quotation of Deuteronomy 21 and 23 is reference to the tree uh, might have reminded the Galatians uh, at least those in, in Pisidian Antioch uh, of his previous teaching to them or preaching and uh, and you'll find that in Acts where he says and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. So Paul was very graphic. We, you know, we, we talked about this already that Paul was very graphic about the, um, uh, way that, um, Yeshua was, was, um, crucified. I mean, it was, it was extremely graphic to, uh, to the, um, Galatians. Because he told him about it, he says, "Don't." He says, "How could you go against this when you were were giving such given such a a graphic description? You know, I just I, with my words, I brought you there to that uh, to that uh, crucifixion. So, um, so perhaps uh, thoughts of Paul's original visit with them might uh, you know might have begun to resurface as they remember that the real purpose of Yeshua." Uh, the real purpose that Yeshua came into their lives. Um, Yeshua came into their lives to redeem them from the consequences that they had incurred for, for violating God's uh, statutes so that they could now live empowered to fulfill God's mission and be a blessing to others. And Paul specifies that the blessing of Abraham as the promise of the Spirit through faith um, after, you know, after a person had faith in God, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then he could properly, uh, and truly, uh, obey God and follow, uh, his precepts because he had, uh, had faith in God, had faith in Yeshua, and then the Holy Spirit, uh, brings him, uh, to, uh, to a closer walk with the Lord. Uh, certainly, if Yeshua had been executed to atone for high sins such as murder, and then anything else that um, that um, you know the not the less serious crime, you know, I sin is sin, but uh, you know, murder is is you know to me that's one of the uh, the worst things that a person can do. Uh, and then you had other other sins that uh, um, lie, cheat, steal. Uh, those kind of things, um, they they didn't they didn't have, they were not a um, um, a death penalty per se, uh, but if if uh, Yeshua's sacrifice on the tree on the cross uh, made atonement for the serious sins of the capital sins, then certainly it would have covered up. Uh, and uh, and atoned for the non-capital sins, and uh, the, so that via his death, all the penalties that you know all of us have incurred uh, because of our violation of, of Torah's commandments have now been repented. And uh, you know we've, we remember in Romans uh, where it says that uh, for the wages of sin is death. You know that's that's what you get from when you uh, sin against God is is death. It's a death penalty, but now that curse is lifted. And uh, so, what does that mean? Uh, what is this curse lifted now? Uh, what does that tell us about uh, the Torah, the status of the of the Torah? Um, now, um, Paul specifically says that the curse of the Torah upon sinners has been removed. But for those who are in Messiah Yeshua, um, or the curse of the, of the Torah has been removed for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. Now, um, notice that Paul does not say that Yeshua has removed the Torah from being a living, a standard of proper living for God's community. 
and that the standard of sin contained in the Torah has gone away. Now, um, tell you what, I, I can't remember if I actually told you this this story or not, but um, a month or so ago, I was up here in Dallas. We were, uh, you know, visiting my son and doing some other things, and um, uh, we were. On our way out of town, uh, we were going to go by his office. Uh, you know, he, he, many of you know he's a chiropractor. We were going to go by his office, um, and uh, then from there we were going to head on home. Well, I got uh, I was tooling on down the road uh, on the the uh, freeway, and uh, the speed limit's about seventy, I guess. So I think I was probably uh, 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 cons- I was doing about seventy five so that I would not get run over. Um, by the the rest of the traffic, and so I came up to my exit, and so here I was cruising on there. I you know at seventy five miles an hour, even though the speed limit was seventy. But then, what I didn't realize was that right at the end of the uh, exit ramp was uh, a speed limit that said sixty. So by the time I got to the, uh, the uh, end of the exit ramp, I had not slowed down one single bit. I was still doing 75 in a 60. And right there, I mean, just right there on the other side of that um, uh, speed limit sign was uh, one of uh, Plano's finest right there. And so he pulled me over. And uh, so I pulled, you know, I pulled over there and uh, he said I was going 15 over. Well, you know, that's that's a um, uh, that can bring you in some municipalities that can bring you a a reckless driving uh, fee fine. And uh, it would be very expensive. And uh, so, you know, I just, you know, (laughs) He said, okay, here's, he wanted my license, so I gave him my license, wanted my insurance, I uh, gave him my insurance. He said, this expired a year ago. Oh, brother. So we're looking through the, the console there, trying to find the, um, trying to find the insurance and couldn't find, uh, the form that, you know, that uh, was a current insurance, even though we, we're, you know, we're currently insured. I just didn't have that form. I hadn't kept it up in uh, in that vehicle. And uh, so the guy says, okay, he took that back, and uh, uh, he was back there for a while. And I said, man, I just can't imagine how much this is going to cost us. You know, we're not, we're, we're not showing proper insurance and doing 15 over. And, uh, uh, you know, so the he uh, he came up to me, and he said, well, um, you know what? He says, I'm just going to give you a warning today and uh, just don't, you know, that's not going to cost you anything. It's just a warning. And so that that was a picture right there of grace. It was unmerited. You know, I, I did the crime and uh, um, I didn't... Um, um, you know, there was, I had no excuse. I was, I was driving 75 in a, in a 60, you know, it, even though, uh, it kind of bogus that the guy's sitting there, whatever, but, you know, and he says, okay, I'm going to give you, uh, a break. And so that was, uh, um, yeah, that was, that was mercy more than justice. As one of my friends in Panama got, uh, got sent to the judge for a traffic violation and the judge, uh, you know, Panamanian, my friend is an American. He, he told him, he says, look, you're going to get justice here. And my friend says, judge, I don't want justice. And he looked at him and he says, I need mercy. And the, the judge got so tickled at him. He threw the case out and let him go. But, uh, and so that's kind of the way I felt, but I had mercy at that point. I had grace at that point. Okay. But, what happens if that that sin that I had committed there uh, was basically forgiven and I was uh, free to go? But what happened to the laws that I had I had broken there? That law did not go away. That law was still there. And uh, just because that policeman had allowed me to go on without paying a penalty other than you know giving me a warning, um, 
did not do away with the law. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, um, get back into into my notes here that um, Paul is not saying that uh, Yeshua removed the Torah um, from us because we we know that uh, Yeshua himself said he didn't come to do away with the Torah, but to fulfill it. And um, you know, the this standard of, of conduct is still there. Those speed limit laws are still there. And uh, nor is Paul saying that keeping the Torah is obey, or which is obeying God, will actually bring a curse. No, that's not what he's saying at all. Okay, so let's uh, let's work through this. Um, we will find some people today that <clears throat> that read it just like this that say that uh, you know. Paul is saying if you keep Torah, then you're bringing a curse on yourself. That's that's uh, that's kind of silly uh, because um, uh, that would be uh, you know that 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 would be like that uh, they're saying uh, this curse of the law is somehow a curse for keeping the law, and this is extremely errant and uh, it's but it's a popular view, and that. Uh, you can you can find it among uh, uh, you know, some main, mainstream Christianity today, but Paul makes it clear that the curse was incurred by disobedience to Torah. That uh, if you didn't keep uh, uh, Torah, the term katara, which is a curse, that applies to everybody, not just the Jew or the Gentile, the uh, the uh, Jewish Christian or, or whoever. Because remember, in Romans it says. For all have sinned, all humanity has sinned and come short of uh, the glory of God. And, and the wages of sin is death. So um, to be a, st- a sinner is to stand under God's wrath and condemnation. So uh, release comes because uh, Yeshua became a curse on our behalf. Elsewhere, Paul confirms that uh, not only uh is disobedience to God's instruction a universal human problem? And it's, uh, you can look it up in Romans 2, 14, 3, 19. But that he he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God made uh, Yeshua who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The curse incurred from obedient, disobedience has been permanently solved because of Messiah's execution. So that's kind of what we're, we're saying. This under the curse does not mean trying to keep the curse. The, the curse was that, um, that uh, when you don't keep all of the law, then the, the wages of that, uh, you know, you're, you're sinning then. And uh, um, at that point, um, uh, when you're when you're sinning, and uh, um, then you bring on this curse of death or the the penalty of death. But what uh, uh, and that's what Paul is saying. He says, you know, we we've, we've been removed from the the curse. Now, um, the curse of the law does not mean Torah. Okay, uh, that you know, if you're keeping the uh, keeping Torah, that does not mean you're under some kind of a curse because that would make it. I mean, that's that's just silly because uh, that would make some of the prohibitions like murder, stealing, um, or covetousness, adultery, all of these different things that um, universally in most most religions and societies, you know, even even among atheists and other Democrats, uh, as uh, the, the uh, these principles should be followed. Um, to to actually be curses, you know, these are uh, um, for us to disregard all of those things. That would that would be um, you know against all proper uh, moral standards, uh, even in some of the the communities that don't have a whole lot of moral standards. You still you don't murder, you don't steal. Uh, the curse of the law refers to the capital penalty that is pronounced upon sinners, uh, which will ultimately result in eternal punishment for those who are unrepentant. So that's what the curse of the law is. It's not the law itself. And, uh, and like I said, it, uh, um, the, it's the, uh, the law uh, 
<clears throat> still remains. It's still there in effect. There, it did not go away with the uh, the death of Yeshua. You know, I've, I've heard it uh, said before that uh, the law was nailed to the tree with uh, Yeshua. No, it wasn't. Uh, maybe your sins were nailed to the tree, but uh, uh, the law itself is still in uh, in force. So um, we get back to this idea of the the blessings and the curses. Um, for Paul, failure to keep Torah had a long-lasting consequence, which uh, it extended from this world into the next. Um, he said a, a righteous man will live or have eternal life by faith. And those, uh, and, and he also said the one who does the commandments will live by them. So again, you're, we're getting to this point where some people say, what, what Paul, you're, you're saying that, uh, if we keep the, all the commandments, we'll, we can live. Um, I guess if it were possible to keep all the commandments, um, I would say that you have a extreme, uh, extreme faith. And uh, I would still say it's not the keeping of the commandments that uh, are uh, justifying you. It's that that faith that you have. Now, one thing I did want to kind of bring out here is uh, to to do a little bit more on the uh, the emphasis because when Paul says the righteous man will live by faith, and you know. In my mind, and, and it's and it's been that way for a long time. You know, we we read about that the righteous shall live by faith, and so what is the uh, what is the um, um, the word? You know, what what uh, what uh, um, word gets the most emphasis? It's faith, because uh, you know generally it's used in a in an argument about uh, the the faith and works. And that's the the argument between back and forth. But I would say uh, look at it a little bit different way here, and let's put the emphasis on a different word. The righteous man will live. He's going to have eternal life. He will live even in in uh, in the present life. He will he will live. He will have a uh, um, a better life, a full life, uh, a fulfilling life. Uh, by his faith, and um, it's uh, so. I think that uh, you can still say the same thing then by the commandments. If you keep God's commandments, you try to do everything that the Lord uh, has pointed out to uh, uh, to us to do. Um, that we will have life, and uh, and I I submit that it's not only what Paul was talking about here is he's talking about eternal life or the in the uh, uh, life to come, uh, the world to come, the olam haba. Um, but I would say that it's also life today, because uh, if we uh, have uh, Yeshua as our our Savior, um, then you know we have a life that uh, is just beyond compare. Um, one of the reasons that I did not send out my uh, uh, invitation last night was that uh, we were with our grandchildren, and we were watching the movie uh, War Room. Now, I would, uh, I'm would i not a movie critic, and I don't normally do this, but I would, uh, I would very strongly, heartily recommend that uh, any of you, if you haven't seen this movie, War Room, uh, get it. Get it because it will encourage you. It will build up your faith, and it will also give you some good um, verses to use uh, when you're trying to uh, um, talk to people about Yeshua. And it is just a, a, a great, uh, great movie. Uh, I'm not, you know, no, normally, normally uh, these Christian movies, you know, these uh, those kind of uh, deals. The acting is so poor. And, uh, it's just, you know, they're, they're kind of embarrassing because they're so schmaltzy and that uh, you're just kind of, you know, and, um, uh, too, too sweet, too sugary. And, um, so, um, um, the, uh, this one here is done very, very well. And, uh, 
I uh, I would recommend that you see that. But anyway, we we saw the movie. It didn't. We didn't end it until uh, l- uh, late, and then uh, uh, we discussed it a little bit and so forth. By that time, it was uh, it was very very late. But anyway, what uh, watch that movie because it does talk about how that your life in Yeshua is a blessing. It just brings blessing. And those that don't live that life, uh, it's a curse. Uh, this this man and this woman, they were not living for the Lord, even though they were going to church and they kind of had the the um, the trappings of uh, faith. They did not have it down in their heart, and so uh, their their marriage was uh, was a battleground. It was uh, it was horrible, and so. Um, there, you know, that's that's that curse. They were not following, it. and uh, you know, Galatians three ten says, "Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the the book of the law and do them." So uh, you're going to have some, uh, you're just going to have some uh, some bad times if you're not following Yeshua. But the a lot of times we cannot, uh, you know, we we just. Uh, we mess things up, uh, you know, we're, we're not perfect. We don't follow things. Uh, but uh, through the, through the uh, blood of Yeshua, then we have um, uh, a remission of our sins and, and we can actually live in right standing before, before God. So the, uh, the function of Torah then is to make us, uh, make man more aware of his uh, of his sin, and um, um, you know we know that uh, Yeshua lived a sinless life. He never violated Torah, and so we all, we talked about it a little bit. How could he take on Torah's curse of hanging on a tree? Uh, because he took on our death penalty. He took on our penalty for death uh, for our sins, and. Because of that, then he was put, uh, he willingly took that on and symbolically then he became accursed uh, for all of us uh, and took on that death penalty. And so that, because of that, both the Jew and the Gentile who have fallen short of God's standard of holiness then can stand uh, be in right standing uh, before, the law, uh, before the Lord. And... Um, uh, this this uh, final curse of the Torah is condemnation in the eternal court of judgment. Uh, Torah brings wrath, um, and that's because it's a it's a sign. It 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 uh, the, it's not the Torah itself that is uh, wrathful or something. It is a, a standard of holiness. It does so by defining sin, and uh, so. One, in other words, one of the functions of Torah is to make us aware of what sin is. And the flip side of this is that those who uh, rely on the faithfulness of Messiah, whether they are a Jew or a Gentile, they are, uh, there is no longer any condemnation. And I'll read uh, uh, Romans 8, uh, um, Romans 8, uh, 1 through 4. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. For the law of the spirit of life is in Messiah Yeshua has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible for the Torah, since it was weakened on account of the flesh, God has done. Uh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, a guilt offering, this uh, um, uh, Asham uh we the Asham offering, um, and uh, he has condemned he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the ruach or the spirit. So, um, uh, according to what was written in Deuteronomy, then uh, Yeshua was uh, cursed. Uh, by God and, and put, you know, but, you know, it's through no fault of his own, no guilt of his own. He willingly took it on. He took on the Torah's condemnation of sin uh, so that all mankind then could be in uh, in um, uh, 
right uh, right standing. So um, anyway, that uh, that pretty well concludes what I wanted to bring out. This this idea of, of cursed, uh, you know, being cursed. Uh, anyone who was on a tree was was cursed, and kind of address it because, like I said, I have talked to uh, um, uh, Jewish folks who have not yet uh, come to uh, to believe in uh, Yeshua as their Messiah, and that's one of the things that. Uh, uh, those uh, those who are a little bit more uh, uh, clued in, uh, keyed in to uh, um, the scriptures, because they will say that you know he he couldn't have been the Messiah because he died, and uh, um, you know of course then the other the other side of it is that there are those who say that there are, there are other uh, there are those that say uh, Menachem Schneerson was the Messiah. And uh, then, you know, you point out to them that, that he died, too. But uh, this is one of their arguments is that he was a curse because he's hanging on a tree. Yes. Symbolically, he was a curse because he was hanging on the tree and he uh, willingly took on that cursedness uh, for you and me that we would not stand. Be- we do not have to stand before God a curse because of our inability to uh, keep his commandments. So Yeshua took that, and now it's our faith in him that brings us salvation. So that is the end of my uh, recorded part, the uh, re- prepared uh, part of uh, the lesson. And uh, I, I hope you uh, you got a little insight uh, into this. I think if uh, the, the one thing that I enjoyed uh, or that I, I got out of it that uh, – was really uh, eye-opening for me was just the the emphasizing a different word as opposed uh, in the, in that the just shall live by faith. No, the just shall live by faith. And uh, so that uh, that meant a lot to me. Hopefully that will mean uh, a good bit to, to each one of you. And uh, also just to remind those of you who are in the Houston area, we're we're going to start meeting. Um, Tree of Life uh, Congregation will start meeting um, on the 13th of February. Um, and uh, basically, if you come and, and uh, visit with us on that at uh, 541 Pin Oak Road uh, at the at the Journey Church um, on Saturday, the uh, 13th of February, we will uh, we're going to be uh, meeting. We're going to be worshiping. But it's going to be kind of working out the kinks with uh, with everything. You can be there and help us uh, as pioneers, as plank owners, because then about a month later, after we get all of the the soundboard and the sound system and the and the sequence and all of that kind of stuff worked out, um, then uh, we'll have a, a grand opening. Uh, you know, big uh, a big to do in uh, sometime in March uh, with. Um, uh, some folks uh, coming in from other parts of the state uh, who wanted to be a part of this, and so uh, yeah, everyone that uh, that uh, wants to, you're still uh, you know still welcome. And I would encourage you come on the 13th to to help us uh, um, to help us uh, kind of work the kinks out because uh, you might have some some things for us that uh, you know I didn't think about and. Uh, I know there are uh, people that, uh, um, you know, that that uh, their their children uh, are high schoolers and they uh, uh, are musicians, and we would like to uh, utilize these young people in uh, in the praise and worship. So anyway, it's it's going to be a good time, and uh, uh, looking at the thirteenth. So uh, God bless all of you, and uh, Shavuot Tov. We will see you next week.